Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, as I said, this is a uh, multi-method groundwater investigation study on the Adelaide's groundwater resources. It's a large group of researchers, both from Flinders and as well as from CSIRO, uh, together with the State Department um, involved. Uh, it's really uh, a study-based um, presentation based on a Goiter project, which is ongoing, uh, the assessment of the Adelaide's groundwater resources. We are very, very busy at the moment, many researchers trying to uh, run their models. Lots of uh, results will come up, and um, I will tell you how we will present that later. So the main aim of this uh, study probably can best be uh, described by this. Adelaide researchers are looking to gain a better understanding of the water resources beneath the city. The two-year project is the first comprehensive look at Adelaide's groundwater in more than a decade. South Australians are well aware how precious water is. Researchers at Flinders University and the CSIRO are turning their attention to the important resource that runs beneath us. The $3 million study funded by the Goida Institute for Water Research will analyse the quantity and quality of Adelaide's groundwater. It takes in an area stretching from Malala to Seacliff and from the foothills to beyond the shoreline. Industry uh, rely very heavily on groundwater as well as market gardeners and also recreational uh, facilities. The Grange Golf Club is one such facility. It has eight bores across the property and relies on them as its primary water source. Without the bore water here we, we'd have uh, a hell of a lot of trouble. We wouldn't be able to maintain the courses without it. The club is mindful of the need to replenish the underground system. We look to harvest as much stormwater as we can through the year and actually inject it back into the aquifer, um, which is sort of stored there, and then we, we bring it out in summer for later for reuse. The study will also examine how the ocean interacts with groundwater and whether our resources continue beneath the sea. So what we are trying to do is really improve our conceptual understanding of this large groundwater system uh, and build an uh, overarching tool to underpin basically the objectives of the Water for Good plan. That really means we're using existing knowledge, we're building on top of uh, the past uh, studies and we are looking forward with respect to uh, future scenarios. A key outcome is therefore really an improved uh, tool model which uh, will be able to uh, predict scenarios but also have estimates of uncertainties. Already, you already saw uh, what kind of large area it is. It basically covers a large part of the central Adelaide prescribed wells area and the northern Adelaide prescribed wells area area and it's in the east bounded by the hills. Main issues in this area with respect to groundwater, and you have seen that groundwater is very important for industry and other uh, sources, users, is the extraction and injection, the consequences of that, but also the salinity in general of groundwater. Com does it come from seawater or maybe from brines? What will potential seawater level change do? Climate change, what kind of impacts do we expect? Now, groundwater uh, doesn't appear always um, in the main headlines in the water use. We hear a lot about uh, desalinization plan. It's maybe not that much in total, but it's very strategic. Uh, these industries, market gardeners, uh, beverage industry are very reliant on this uh, source of water. Now, what kind of problems do we have? We have long-standing, what we call, cones of depression, where the groundwater levels are much lower and where we have flowed towards these cones of depressions. We are not sure how stable this is in terms of future use of groundwater in such areas. These cones of depression, they do not recover during the winter. We have a large number of uh, uh, extractions. Uh, all the green dots in this map are extractions. You see in the northern Adelaide Plains area near Virginia that there are many, many bores. But we also have more and more MAR sites injecting groundwater, and we are not sure about how much more can we uh, have of those, what would be possible consequences of that, or where would you optimally place these ones. So how do we study such problems? Now, in general, in groundwater research, it's often kind of a thick fog. 
we are not very sure where we are. We don't see very well ahead of us or where we are. It's like driving in, a, in this big fog. And so what we generally do is we are making use of lots of data. For example, the best geological information that we can get. We drill new uh, boreholes from which we extract data, both level data, quality data, cores, for example, of aquitards, which we can analyze in detail. And by all this type of data, we get slightly more view on uh, the system. Uh, we collect groundwater level data, salinity data, which is um, very widely available, chemistry of groundwater, isotopes, and recharge data. That all slowly lifts the fog. Uh, and what we get as a result is a kind of a view on the concept uh, and the reality of the of the real world. Now, we are never able to fully describe this real world, and that's why we put always this data in a logical framework, which we call a groundwater model. And that's which make, gives sense and the relationships to all this data. So it's a kind of a laboratory for us to test our conceptual understanding. So what are the elements of this uh, data that we use? Uh, first of all, some uh, geology. This is a very typical cross-section from um, west from the Mount Lofty areas to the coast. You see here the basement rocks uh, underneath the city, and you see a fault. Uh, also here at the uh, foot of the hills, there is an important fault of over which we think there is groundwater flow coming into the aquifers. The main aquifers of use are the tertiary aquifers here in the plains, the tertiary one and the two aquifer, which are separated by a clay layer. And we don't know very well how that clay layer behaves. We also have this coastal boundary. And that are basically the key issues of uncertainty in our understanding. How does this boundary work? How, is it a barrier or uh, does it easily allow water to flow in from the Mount Lofty area? That is the flow coming in. Uh, that's the flow across the fault issue. We have leakage between these aquifers. Or do we not have leakage between the, these aquifers? What does this clay layer do? This seawater boundary and the salinity is also a very important water quality issue, of course. So data that we use, groundwater levels, uh, we have uh, lots of bores in which we measure them, we can contour them. We drilled new uh, bores here on a cross section roughly in uh, central uh, over the city uh, area from east to west, which gives us lots of new information with respect to the chemistry but also isotopic data. Lots of sampling was done. Here, a new borehole on the uh, Trinity Garden Schools, um, which was drilled there last year. So if we look at this clay layer, what does this clay layer do? Is that a barrier, or does it allow groundwater flow to come through? Now, if you look at water levels on both sides of the clay layer, then this is the water level below the clay layer, and that's the water level uh, both the clay layer, which indicates that below the clay layer there is a higher pressure and that you maybe would expect groundwater to flow vertically through this clay layer. That's consistent in all the different wells where we look at. However, you see over time, since the 1980s, that the difference in this pressure slowly reduces or maybe even inverts, which would indicate that we have a change in the system, probably due to pumping. But we don't know what that means in terms of flow through this aquitard, because it's just a pressure that we measure. So what we do is we core the aquitard. And basically, that's a 10-meter thick clay layer. And we expect that there might be diffusion of um, uh, solutes through this aquitard. And then there is no flow. Or maybe there is flow. And then the profile of an isotope would look like this. If there is upward flow or if it's downward flow, the profile would like, would like that. We do that for different... Um, isotopes like, for example, helium-4. Now, what we see is none of those conceptual models that we thought would maybe occur is actually occurring. 
because the profile that we measure is quite different from any uh, of the ones we perceived, which means science is not always, uh, we do not always, we have some surprise, uh, basically, which is sometimes very interesting. And the question is, of course, why is there a surprise? Uh, the surprise is because in the layers above and below, the concentration is very low, and here in the clay layer, it's much higher, which means there is basically only diffusion uh, through this clay layer and no flow through it. But it's difficult to understand why this clay layer has so much higher concentrations of helium than in the aquifer below, for example. That might be due to the fact that we have a transient condition and that this aquifer is changing quite rapidly in time, maybe also due to pumping. Basically, the groundwater, what this profile uh, tells us, the groundwater becomes much younger than it used to be. Um, and so uh, that's a change in the system of the, that aquifer. Now, if we look a little bit more in the wider context of a number of uh, profiles from uh, the hills to the coast and north and here in the um, central transect, then this northern profile looks more or less like this. Here we have the hills with relatively young groundwater. These are years of age, basically, of the groundwater, and 4,000 years I call young. Um, and here it's slightly younger even. But if you look here in the aquifer, it increases from about five, ten thousand up to about 30 or 35,000 years old groundwater. Now, that's over a distance of about 25 kilometers, and some very basic calculations shows that that groundwater would have only a velocity of about half a meter per year, which is about this speed in one year. Um, in the central transect, we see similar ages uh, within the hills, relatively younger water, uh, but still in the order of 10,000. Some things happening here near the fault where it looks younger and maybe some more recent water is entering the system. And then here in the plains, again, ages up to 35 or even 40,000 years. Um, very, very old groundwater all. Now, what we also see is from the many, many, many um, uh, uh, electrical conductivity data, basically quality data of the many bores that we have all over the plains. All those dots are bores where we have uh, electrical conductivity, salinity, let's call it like that, data. And this map shows an interpolation in red, the more um, salty areas, saline areas, and in blue, the fresher areas. That these fresher areas uh, are all located along the creeks, which comes from the hill, and there is each time quite a zone of uh, fresh groundwater, which quite clearly indicate that there is quite some in, uh, interaction between uh, surface water and groundwater. Probably the Greeks are quite infiltrating and recharging uh, those local aquifers. So quite important probably as a process in terms of um, uh, recharge to the uh, aquifers. Now, salinity as on the other side, the coastal boundary, is also a very important uh, point of discussion and issue. Here you see a graph of the relative sea level, uh, which we expect to rise in the future uh, with maybe another half a meter. It has already been rising the last uh, 50 years, um, and that's about half a meter. Now, if we take a bit longer perspective, and longer means in this graph up to 400,000 years, you see that, in fact, the, ground, the sea level has most of the time been much lower than the current sea level, which is about this level. Uh -huh. And that about 20, 30,000 years ago, the age of my groundwater in the last profiles, the sea level was about 120 meters lower than currently, um, which means that basically instead of this type of profile on the coast, we would have had something like this. Uh, the sea way out uh, from the current position, 
Now, what kind of influence does that have on the groundwater system, or how has that influenced the system? Now, one very likely possibility is that that has created brines, locations with a very high uh, salinity, much higher than the current seawater level concentration, seawater concentration. For example, in Welonga, there are several locations where we already have observed these qualities which are much higher than seawater. Also, in the Adelaide areas, there are a number of locations where we expect they are not confirmed all, uh, where these deeper uh, saltwater concentrations, high concentrations are occurring. An example of what that uh, the importance of that um, might be is that this is a graph in blue of the water level since uh, 1990 to 2008 of a particular point. And at some point, there was a lot more pumping going on. The water level dropped quite dramatically over a short time. In red, you see the graph, which is the salinity, or the TDS, which went immediately up very dramatically, way above the um, sea water concentration, which could be potentially explained by the fact that if you pump above a brine in relatively fresh water, you get this upconing of this brine and that might have potentially come into that well. So how do we put all this information together? We put it all together uh, in a groundwater modeling framework. Um, and that groundwater model has been updated quite dramatically uh, compared to previous models. We change a lot of conditions, as we call it, boundary conditions, recharge conditions. Also, we build a transport model for simulating the uh, salinity, the uh, concentrations, and also that model has been updated. Very interesting and important is that we use uh, lots of data for this transport model uh, based on electrical conductivity data, which are very widely available and which are turned into a, a stable or uh, converted to a chlorine concentration such that we can simulate the, these data as conservative tracers. That all... This is an example of such an output spatially of uh, the transport model that we will be able to simulate. Now, all this data comes together, and by way of the physical relationships in the model, we will be able to do the calculations. And, of course, that needs a lot of calibration on head data, but also on this concentration data. Um, that will be uh, the, con the calibration will be for a large range of parameters, both in the steady and transport models for historical conditions, but also transient conditions. The last few sheets are have a few graphs which are basically uh, how the model looks like with a lot of data coming from Junar with the newest hydrogeological layers which are all implemented in this model. This is uh, the topography of the uh, data uh, set, basically. The top of the tertiary one aquifer, the bottom of it, the top of the next aquifer, the bottom of it, uh, the next aquifer below it, and the bottom bedrock uh, area. Now, the modeling framework is also very adaptive. We have worked a lot on that in terms of making simulations feasible for different grid cell sizes. With a, a small change in the program, we can change, for example, the grid from 2,000 meters to 1,000 to 500 meters. Um, and that gives a lot of flexibility in terms of the modeling. Final sheet is basically what do we do at the moment? We are modeling scenarios, uh, basically going business as usual, but then towards the future. How will the system change? Because the system is changing, and if you continue in the same way, it still uh, has an impact. But also uh, scenarios with respect to rainfall reduction, uh, MAR increase in injection, uh, and increase uh, in groundwater pumping. To finally sum up the um, main conclusions, this modeling methodology uh, is a kind of a train which is riding. There are a number of models which have to be feed, 
that with a lot of data and which hopefully can lift some of the fog and make a physical sense of uh, the system. Okay, thank you very much.